Is that right? The first one, the first one is, the first one is the ego. Yeah. The second one is the soul. Okay. And in the number three. Okay. What what is in number three? I'm still a little unclear about that. In shamanism. We have this, what we call the middle world, ordinary reality, where the egos flourish. And, ego. Yeah, okay. And we have uh, the upper world and the lower world, and we have different levels. The astral plane concept is something I think people use to describe when shamans journey to the upper and lower worlds, they're going into the astral reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but number three is a little unclear to me. Is that the... Number three is the, um, is the mystic... part of us. Um, your number two and my number two are, are individual. Individual. But your number three and my number three, it's the same thing. So Not, not just looks the same, mm -hmm. but is the same. Well, shamans do experience uh, and they've done enough work sort of a cosmic unity and in fact they draw on the power of this unity is that what you're talking that's about? Right. That's the right. ineffable thing? Yes, yeah. yes. Now the way I see it is that is inside the soul. Uh, what I, studying shamanism worldwide, I look at Siberia for example and despite Gordon Wasson's claims by and large, the shamans in Siberia do not touch the Amanita muscari mushroom. The ordinary people do who want to get possessed by the mushroom. The other shamans, the real shamans, the ordinary shamans are using the drum. Uh, Wasson and the people that he was depending upon were not sophisticated about who was doing what. And so if Siberian shamanism is not drug dependent, and that's the classic, most important part of, hmm. classic part of shamanism, hmm then why is that an inferior kind of shamanism? That's where the word comes from. So let's look at it. If you read some publications, you get the impression that the deep, the shamanism is just simply deep trips. Yeah. And there's no mention of healing work. Mm. Now, yes, those deep trips can really be something. But that's not shamanism. That may be a wake up. But shamanism is a day-to-day -day activity, which indeed in some areas like the upper Amazon is done with the aid of ayahuasca and so on, uh, but it's not essential to the practice of shamanism, which is known all over the world. And what's really important about shamanism is becoming aware of the subtleties of what is going on in the universe with the spirits and so on, and working with them to heal and help people. But now we reach the point where people who are ready and without psychedelics can start having through the journey sort of experiences yes. which in their cumulative effect lead them to the same place. Yes. But there may not be the big bang. You know, I, I yeah. had a, 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 I was um, giving a lecture and a woman about my age now, about 50, 60, whatever it is, 70. And, um, <laughs> Uh, and she was on the front row and she was going like this. I was describing psychedelic, um, psychedelic trips and she was going like this. And I think, what, how did she, she, she doesn't look like an acid head, you know, and she's going, and so at the end of the lecture, I really, I willed her up. <laughs> and um, I said, um, how do you know all this stuff? She said, I crochet. <laughs> I think they would, um, they would, they would exp converse with converse with as two as two souls, and they would 
they would look at their incarnations as learning experiences. And um, um, yeah, it, that was that's a shift in consciousness, a, an evolutionary shift in consciousness. Well, if I could uh, pre preface my real thought with a stupid joke is that one of the reasons that uh, grandchildren and grandparents get along so well is they have a common enemy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in tribal cultures around the world, they're sometimes called by the same name, the grandparental generation and the, and the grandchildren's generation. There is that close relationship. And they may belong to the same, uh, uh, same, same clan whereas the parents won't, and so on. But that's not really what I wanted to say. Uh, of course, none of us really knows what's going to happen, and it's really a mess, as we all know. And technology is centralizing things that George Orwell would never realize, you know, and Freer is centralizing. So setting that aside, however, let's just go to the spiritual. My hope, and I had to say my hope, is that I was hoping we were going to have political democracy around the world. I, I'm not so sure. I mean, I, uh, who knows? But that was the trend, it has been a trend for a while, starting back with the American Revolution. Uh, but I do think, uh, and, I, and I do think there is a chance that spiritual democracy is being born. Uh, I think the Protestant Reformation was a very small step, very small step in that direction because it really ended up being very similar to the thing it was replacing. But I think the direct spiritual work that we're doing will not go away. It may go underground and so on, I hope it doesn't, but I think ultimately people will want their freedom and fight for the freedom if necessary, but I hope it doesn't come to that to be able to work without spiritual dogma and spiritual authorities and so on. This is one of the reasons my work is so easy because it, if, I mean, at first I don't have the capacity, but if I tried to be a spiritual authority, it would work just the opposite of what shamanism is all about. You have a tougher job because people come to you and look at you as authority whether you want it or not. So anyway, that's my take on it, that we have it a motion in action to achieve spiritual democracy as our hunting gathering ancestors once had. Uh, it's, we're closer to science than religion is because we are conducting experiments all the time and finding out what things are really like. And uh, in that sense, I think time is on our side, but who knows. Where, what do you... Spiritual democracy, what does that mean? Well, what I mean is that there's nobody over you telling you what to believe and uh, saying this is your faith, because then it becomes faith. This the work we do is not faith, it's experiential. And people have a chance to conduct experiments and have their own direct contact with what I would call the spiritual world. Don't you think those experiments lead to faith? No, I think faith leads to those experiments. When you had those deep psychedelic experiences, you, you're, you're, you had faith, hey, there's something going on, but I don't know what it is. And then you went to your guru, experiments were conducted in front of you, and you started changing. That's my opinion. But in our work, I try to avoid telling people too much about what to expect because I want them to have the autonomy of discovery and sharing with each other. That's spiritual democracy. To me. Yeah.